All right, hello everyone, we are back. It is time for our last panel of the convention. Thank you all for sticking with us this whole time. Uh, we're gonna get Steve back in here to talk about uh, Magical Girl Shows, right? Yeah, that's exactly what we're gonna yeah, do. Yeah, they have a, a, a full, complete history of Magical Girl, I believe. It's yes. The, the yes. plan for the next one. I kid. Um, <laughs> got some samurai coming at you here, if I recall correctly. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful um, Magical Girl Samurai. That's exactly <laughs> what we are Why doing. Why does it exist? I don't there's, know. There it, 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 it sounds like it would work. You better yeah. call dibs on that, because somebody right now is going to Yeah. <laughs> samurai Magic Girl. Yes. Exactly. All right. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, let me get situated here at the uh, Starship Enterprise. Uh, with, uh, Thank you. All righty. I hope everyone had a great OnCon. It, uh, I had a fun time. I'm actually here in Brent's place, and it is quite magical, I have to tell you. Um, no, seriously, we had a great time today, and, and, um, and I hope you're having a good time as well. So let's go ahead and get started with talking about the samurai, how they went from being these great, wonderful warriors to sad, bloated sacks of bureaucracy. So, yes, that's essentially the history of, of the samurai right there. Um, so when we think of samurai, we think of um, basically a very stoic character. We think of a, a man who has a purpose, a mission. He is uh, very capable, He can, um, but reserved, uh, very action-oriented, kind of wise. So a very, very stoic kind of, kind of person. And this image is what we get whenever we think about samurai. And when we think about samurai, what, what country do we think of? We think of Japan. Now, that's by no mistake, obviously, but there's actually a propaganda reason for that. And the reason for that, and the reason why we get such characters in anime that are samurai, is because of this. And it has to do with the Meiji Restoration. So when the Meiji Restoration came in, and they wanted to modernize Japan in any way that they could, but they also did some things with the feudal system which caused the samurai to lose power. But to get the people of Japan to buy into what the government was doing, which is to provide um, like transportation, trains, to, to have new improvements in agriculture, to science, technology, and all that wonderful fun stuff, they needed the people to buy into it because it was going to be a major project to, be, to take the people out of one form of government that they've been in for millennia and basically, in terms of time, overnight, put them in a new new world to be able to compete with nations like the United States. Remember, in uh, 1853, Perry shows up, Admiral Perry, Commodore Perry shows up. He says, he delivers a note and says, hey, you're going to open your nation to us or else, basically. And they come to the conclusion that they're going to live in the world. They have to be in the world. But in order to get that, you have to buy the people. So... What's something that what's what's an iconic image that the people can rally behind it that's that seems like a symbol of the um, of the power of the empire of the power of the emperor and the imperial court something that you can trust well everybody knows you can trust a samurai right so the Meiji government from the imperial court on down basically said okay well, we're going to capitalize the heck out of the samurai so they created a lot of myths around the samurai. And, and the idea of showing loyalty, fealty, um, you know, which are virtues of a samurai, and they wanted that from the people, so they would not necessarily question when the government said, um, we're going to take your land so we can run a train through here, and instead of them fighting against it like they've been doing for centuries, they would say, uh, okay, maybe. Maybe this might be a good idea. So they would use the samurai in, pro in propaganda to help them <coughs> sell being modern. And it was kind of... an interesting way of using the past to sell for the future. So this is why when we watch anime, we get the samurai that we get. A very powerful man, uh, a guy who is skilled, smart, wise, loyal, um, very, very, you know, few and sparse with words, um, knowledge of Buddhism, you know, just a, the perfect guy that you want to, to follow. Never surrender. Never surrender, yes. A guy you want to... <laughs> that's right. So following a leader 
And this is what the samurai represented. And the samurai represents the imperial court, which represents the government. So this is what they were selling. So this is how we get anime characters. And we get anime along the lines of uh, like things like Gintama, Afro Samurai, Samurai Shoplu, or Shoplu, and a, and a little anime you might have heard of, um, uh, Rurouni Kenshin. Have you guys heard of that? You know, I, you know, maybe you might have heard about that. I'm not sure. What do you think, Brian? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so basically, it was just an idea to sell and to to put it in the words of the historian of Nukaraya. I'm sorry for my Japanese. I'm horrible. My pronunciation is horrible. Um, Nukaraya Kaiten wrote, uh, let's see here, Bushido, or the Code of Chivalry, should be observed not only by the soldier in the battlefield, but by every citizen in the struggle for existence. If a person to be a person and not a beast, then he must be a samurai, brave, generous, upright, faithful, and manly, full of self-respect and self-confidence, at the same time, full of spirit and self-sacrifice. This is what they were asking of the Japanese people. They wanted the Japanese people to say, you are samurai. Yes, you are. You might be a peasant. You might be in the mud, you know, planting rice, but you're a samurai and we need you. So this was the whole idea of, 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 of putting the myth out there. So getting people to, to, uh, to, to buy into the idea of being modern. So how did the samurai start? How did this cast start? Well, the samurai, when they first came into being, were not warriors. They were administrators. Uh, so basically what happened is that in, uh, was it 946, or I'm sorry, 646, there's uh, these reforms called the Teika reforms. And the Emperor Tenji instituted these, yes, Tenji, <laughs> Tenji, uh, instituted, instituted these, um, these reforms, and they wanted to style a better government for Japan. And they modeled it after the Tang Dynasty in China. And the idea was that the emperor realized that he needed to buy, he needed to have more better, uh, have, have better control over the populace. And way, the way he wanted to do that was create a better, <clears throat> more detailed feudal system. So going, reaching down. So what's the best way to get people to tie, be tied to you? Is that you give them a position of authority, power, and a little bit of wealth. So you take it all the way down the chain to the people. Now, in the Tang Dynasty, there is various levels of, of bureaucrats. Because the Tang Dynasty was so huge, there are very many levels of it. The Japanese didn't need that many. They needed only 12. So, it, you know, because, you know, not as big. And, but the, the, the ones that were the sixth rank and lower were called samurai. And samurai comes from the, um, let's see if I can find the word here. Uh, Subaru, which means to serve. So what would happen is that the imperial court would find somebody in your village. So, uh, yeah. so, so the emperor would find somebody in your village who had some type of ties to the imperial court, whether it be a blood relation, a marriage, some type of, some type of connection where they can say, the imperial court can say, hey, you, I'm going to choose you to administrate these lands for the local lord. While you are helping the local lord you know, administrate his lands, you are going to also report back to the imperial court. So it would, the guy was kind of put in a tough situation a little bit. He, he would, on a day-to-day -day basis, would make sure that the farms are going, that the taxes are being collected and things like that. And at the same time, he would do a report for the local Diamo and saying, hey, here's how things are going. Maybe we can do these things better. And while he's giving that report, he's giving the same report to the emperor. So this way, you control the emperor and the imperial court is able to control pretty much daily life. This would go on for, until about 1000 AD when the emperor at that time decided to go, I'm going to focus on making flower arrangements and... Um, maybe do a little bit of justice, you know, court justice kind of things. And, oh, I'm going to point this guy, call him a shogun, and he's going to run the day-to-day -day stuff. So the shogun, at this point in time, becomes the actual authority in Japan. The emperor becomes more or less a figurehead and of his own choice. So the samurai start um, reporting back to the shogun. Now, here's the kicker. 
up until this point, the local lords like to live well. And sometimes they have to fight battles. These things cost money. So what happens is that the local lord will go back to his lands and go to the farmers. Um, I need money, so I'm going to tax you. And often what happened would be that farmers would be taxed to the point where they would lose their lands and become basically unemployable and homeless. This caused peasant rebellions, at which point the samurai would be tasked to hire warriors to come in and quell the peasants, the peasant rebellions. Now, these were just like really small rebellions, you know, per lord. You, you know, it wasn't like a big national thing, but it would happen from time to time in various other places. And the imperial court would rely on the local nobles to take care of it because Japan really didn't have a standing army at that point. So the samurai would hire these guys to kill the ringleaders, kill whoever they needed to be killed, bring the peasants under control, at which point the local lord would turn around and say, you cost me a lot of money. I had to hire these guys to kill your family members, so um, we're going to raise taxes. So it's this continuous vicious, vicious cycle. Now keep in mind that the samurai, the administrators, are tied to these local areas. They're from that area. They know people. Some of them you know, have families there. And so these people would go back to the samurai and go, please, for the love of all that's holy, do something. You, this has got to stop. We cannot maintain this. We, we, if, if we do this for this guy who's greedy and just wants to, you know, eat rice cakes all day, I don't know. He, you know what? What? You know what are we supposed to do here? Please do something. You have the ear of the emperor. So the samurai turned around and said, "Okay, well, every time there's a rebellion, we're going to hire these warriors, right? How many of these warriors are actually local?" It turns out that a lot of them are. So the samurai says, "Well, I'm of this rank in in the bureaucracy." If I hire these warriors as part of my government crew, I can give them some money. I can give them a stipend. I can give them a rank. They will become officials of the imperial court. That means that they'll have authority. They'll be able to do things. So I'm going to make these warriors samurai. So they become, so now this is where you get the warrior component of being a samurai. So instead of being thugs and killing people for money, now they actually have status, which is almost as good as currency. And they're tasked to police what's going on around them. So as, as they're doing this, then the samurai turn around and go, okay, Lord, I know, I, you know, the, to the Lord of the, of the land, Diamo, and goes, look, you know that I am an official of the imperial court. That means not only am I here to assist you, but I also represent them. I also represent the people that you're taxing. So you're taxing way too much. You've got to stop. The Lord would turn around and say, huh, that's okay. I'll just hire some, uh, some thugs to go down there and kill you and all your friends. About that, I've hired them. They are now samurai. They belong to the imperial court. They are representing the emperor. If you attack them, you are attacking the emperor. Do you really want to do that? <laughs> no. So what happened was then at that point, a more even balance came out of, of that in terms of taxation, in terms of ruling, and who has actual power sharing. Because these samurai are... Are, we're doing a tech check to make sure that we, we, have, uh, we have full sound and video. Um, so to make sure um, that uh, everyone is behaving, you know, they send the reports back, the samurai send the reports back, but they don't send them back to the emperor, they send them back to the shogun. And this is important as well, because now the shogun has even more authority and more power within the imperial court. So now the power of the emperor is totally eclipsed. Not only that, but the re there's a reduction of power of the nobility within the imperial court. So now the shogun is calling all the shots. And he's able to say to, to the nobles saying, look, I have a bunch of samurai that are running the country right now, so they can't be here in Edo, you know, just because you want them to be here for six months out of the year, which, mean, which is basically a way to control people. 
So we're going to keep the samurai out there since I'm going to be here. Maybe we'll keep the higher ranking ones coming in about a couple months a year. The higher ranking samurai would come in, meet with, with the shogun, advance the agenda. So now the nobility is finding that they don't have as much power in the imperial court. They still have power. They still have legal authority. They, they still have all these things. But they aren't nearly, they don't have unlimited power. They can't just go up to somebody and kill him without some type of cause. And the samurai are there, almost like Jedi, just to keep the peace. And that's, and that's how they act, and that's how, that's how they move. So, as we go through the, through the history of this, this goes on for a couple hundred years. And uh, then the samurai start getting a little rowdy. And they realize that they have a lot of power. And having this power unchecked is a bad, is a bad idea. So the Shogun says, well, how do, we, how do we keep these guys in check? Well, we need to hold them accountable. We need to hold them accountable to law. So what kind of law do we give them? Well, we allow them to, to develop what's called a Bushido Code. So you've all heard of that. Now, Bushido Code is, there's not one single Bushido Code. It's actually many codes, uh, dozens of codes have propped up over the years uh, in Japan. Each, each one of them has three core concepts to them and then the kind of like local traditions and laws that, that factor into it. So to control the samurai from top to bottom, they have to adhere to a code. And the three concepts of this code are um, pretty rigid and purposely so, to give the samurai balance um, and authority and to also give them temperance. So the first part of this is from a text called The Way of the Horse and the Bow. Or I'm sorry, The Way of the Bow and Horse. And this is basically a military manual. And what it does is, is it teaches you comportment for how you act on and off the battlefield. It's kind of like how we would look at today how an officer is supposed to act when he's not engaged in military functions and when he is engaged in military functions. So that's what that means. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's a way to make sure that they aren't just thugs with swords riding around. So there's an organization to it. There's a training to this. There's a respect to it. There's a loyalty. There's, there's definitely a hierarchy of command that has to be followed. Okay. So there's, there's the physical, the combat. The next part, the, the second um, um, core concept of this is, has more to do with justification of who they are, their faith. And Zen Buddhism is perfect for the samurai. So Zen Buddhism has a has a has an inter Buddhism in general has an interesting uh, philosophy of which is you don't kill people, you just don't, right? So at this point you're saying, well, how does the samurai do his job if he's not allowed to kill people? Well, that's where it kind of gets interesting because within Zen Buddhism, there is a uh, portion of it called the Amida Buddha, Amida. I'm sorry, the Amida Buddha. And the Amida Buddha is a kind of a shortcut for samurai. And basically, Amida says, look, we know that you're killing people. And we know that sometimes this has to happen. As long as you are doing this for the greater good, like if you're killing an evil person, we can take that into account. So that when you die, these are things that I will judge you by. And if you are killing for the sake of killing and you're just an awful person, you know, bad things aren't going to happen to you. If you're a good person and you're, and you're just forced into the situation where you have to kill for uh, justice, uh, righteousness, uh, protection, these, these things matter, then when you die, I will take you into, the hope is that the samurai will be taken into by the Amida Buddha to his domain where he lives one more life, where everything he does is examined and scrutinized by the Amada Buddha, but the Amada Buddha also helps him along, helps guide him to make the right choices. So the samurai basically just say, okay, so as long as I do it for the right reasons and I do it effectively, not in a malicious, torturous way, then perhaps Amada will look upon me favorably and when I die, I might go to this domain, live one more life, and if I do well, then I'll go on to heaven. That is the hope of the samurai. Now, how this connects to, to Zen Buddhism is the idea that life and death are the same thing. 
you cannot have death without life. You cannot have life without death. And because samurai deal in death, they realize that Zen Buddhism basically allows them to be the harbingers of death. Like they, they, they are actually performing a service, a spiritual service almost. It's, it's kind of a weird way to say, oh, it's okay, I can kill these people because spiritually speaking, I, I have to mete out death because death is part of life. So it's, it's kind of a weird way and kind of twisted uh, twisted logic there, but that's what it was the appeal. So that's your second core concept of the Bushido Code. The third core concept that you're going to find anywhere has to do with Confucius. And the idea between uh, behind Confucius' philosophy, not religion, is that, again, if you are going to be a samurai warrior, you want people to follow you because you are representing the imperial court, you're representing the government, you want people to stand in line. Now, if you're just a thug with a sword or a pike or a bow and arrow or something of that nature and you're just that's and you're just, you know, just muscle basically, that's all people are going to see you as. And that's not what the samurai want to be. So Confucianism provides you refinement. In order to be a leader, you have to have an education. So this education talks about cultural education, talks about literal education, reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, things of that nature. To be a samurai, you have to be literate. You have to be able to read Chinese philosophy, which is a very big deal, actually. Because at this point in time in Japan, um, Chinese philosophy, thought, um, poetry, art, technology, government is highly valued by the Japanese. So to have these, um, so to be able to lead the people, you have to be able to be a good example. And to be a good example, you have to learn. You have to be literate, learn uh, to read and write. You have to do, be able to do certain ceremonies. This is where the tea ceremony comes up, the flower ceremony, the ekiban ceremony, where you, you, know, you bend the flowers and everything. That's actually, there's a reason behind it. It's supposed to teach you patience and, um, and, and just a, a solid state of mind. Also, what this does is that Confucianism also tells you that you have to revere your ancestors. You have to have piety. You have to have uh, fidelity. Uh, not only to your wife, but also loyalty to your, to your, um, to your commander, to your lord, to the shogun, to the emperor. These are all very important things. If you don't have these things, then you're just a thug and you're not a leader. So these are the three core concepts that you have to have in a Bushido code. Now, at this point, once you have those three concepts, you learn them and, and you get them, then that's when you take into effect of local traditions, local laws, and things like that that can like uh, support or enhance those three core concepts. So once you become, once you learn all that, and you become a proper samurai, the question remains: How do you become a samurai? I mean, do you just get to go show up one day and you learn these three core concepts and that's it, and you, and you get to be a samurai? No. So they're basically three ways to get it. Generally speaking, three three ways to be a samurai. The first one is that you're born into a samurai family. So remember, these were originally imperial appointments. So then you have the ability to be born into, and it's hereditary, so your sons or your son could be a samurai as well. So this is passed down from generation to generation to generation. And if you decide that at a certain point that you want your son to learn the ways of a warrior, which is most often a good idea, because if you're going to lead other warrior samurai, you should probably know a thing or two about how to wield a sword or a spear or a bow and arrow. So you often are either, if you come from a poor samurai family, you are taught by family members who are also samurai on how to be a samurai. And then once they feel that your education is complete, then they announce you as a samurai. If you're rich, then you send your son or sons to a samurai academy. These are actual academies that are all across the nation in schools where you go to learn um, basically, uh, you know, basics like um, Aikido, fencing, um, all these different things, um, as well as literature, poetry, learning how to read and write, how to administrate, how uh, tactics, all these different things. So you go to that, and normally you would go f until about somewhere between the age of 17 and 20, depending upon where you are in your skill level, 
and you take a test and the test is different from academy to academy to academy and the test determines whether or not you you have the skill set to be a proper samurai you graduate from that academy and then your status is considered and if you come from if your samurai uh, status has a higher rank odds are you'll get that rank as well when your father retires or passes away uh, sometimes you start off at, at the bottom rung and you have to work your way up okay so that's one way to get through it you're born into the family the other part of this is of course as you probably could tell you need money okay so sometimes the rich merchants or rich nobles would say oh I have a lot of money and maybe I can just buy an appointment to the academy and send my son or sons to this academy and have them become samurai perfectly legit but they still have to be able to pass the, t the exam that the, the academy presents if they can pass the exam they become a samurai now this is the point where the noble then sets se um, steps in and says oh hey um my son's not gonna be a low-ranking guy he's gonna be a high-ranking guy okay so so here we go so there's a lot of nepotism in this in this in the second part third part which is sort of the more romantic version which is you get the battlefield recommendation so let's say you're some poor schmuck who gets recruited by the samurai to help fight in a battle and you carry a spear you walk into battle and you do really well you actually know what you're doing and you you comport yourself well on the battlefield you're, you don't look like a sadist you look like you know you know how to handle a spear uh, people follow you into battle those kinds of things the samurai or commander or officer of your unit might recognize that and go you know what this guy might make a good samurai so you don't have to be that young you can you can actually be in your teens or your 20s and and still get to be a samurai so what they do is they come back after the battle particularly if you once the battle is won and you go to the commanding general or the noble and say hey this guy here did really well you tell him about the guy's deeds and you say I petition him to become a samurai at this point if they agree with you then they turn around and they say okay yes you become basically what's an apprentice or a squire if we're talking about you know if you're talking about knighthood to another samurai who will coach you over a period of years and will determine whether or not you are a proper samurai at which point you become a samurai but you're you start off at a little lower rank and you have to work your way up so that's those are basically the ways how to, to become how a um to become a samurai um let me if you fail the exam you don't die so that's the question is uh what happens if you fail the exam um if you fail the exam you simply fail it you can return to an academy after a certain amount of time it depends on the rules of the academy you can even go to a different academy um the the, the point is is that you um is that, is that you train and someone has to approve you so it could take years for you to become a samurai so in fact akira kurosawa's uh samurai trilogy shows this shows how long it takes for an individual to become a samurai it's a really good trio of movies you should watch them so like a uh, average day of a training of someone who going who goes to the academy to to become a samurai you wake up at 6 30 a.m you go to the dojo you um you, you you do your ovulations you eat a a sparse uh breakfast you uh do some weapons training early in the morning you do physical training in the morning you do unarmed training in the morning then you have another break for about a half hour then you learn stuff chinese poetry how to how to write calligraphy things like that and then you end the day with a short physical regimen and then you have to go home at 4 30 where you are expected for 4 30 to 5 30 to do your studies from 5 30 to 6 30 you do your dinner you have you eat your food and from 6 30 to 7 that's your own time whatever you want to do with those 30 minutes and you go to bed at seven o'clock at night and then you repeat the process and this can take a number of years the samurai the process of if you if you're a father and you want your son to be a samurai the process starts at the age of three where you give your son or sons um basically wooden blades practice blades to beat each other with basically get yeah the bokens and to beat each other up until about the age of 10 when they are considered to be old enough to understand that a blade is a serious thing and that some of the richer families would give their that son a a, a sword to practice with um 
which I'm going to get into in the academies, this is important. When you have a blade, when you learn how to use a blade, it's one thing to practice and swish in the air. It's one thing to practice on a dummy. It's another thing to parry or to practice with someone else when you're not actually being stabby or slashy. So to get so to build confidence in killing a person, because this is what being a samurai is all about, it's about death, they will take a local convict who's been executed. They will string him up, okay, kind of like this, and then the samurai classes fight amongst each other, you know, hand to hand, and the winners, the, the people who are still standing, get one or two cuts at the convict's corpse. So they're given a blade, a katana, and they're told, stab, then slash. So that they know what it feels like to stab somebody and what it feels like to slash at somebody. And the idea is that you want to be one of the first guys to do that because the corpse isn't as mutilated. So by the, when you get to the end of it, it just looks like a pig carcass. It doesn't look like a human anymore. So, you know, that's, it's, it's grim, but, you know, so is the business of death. So that's, that's kind of the thing. So let's talk about the, the, the heyday of the ceremony. Oh, before I get into that, women. Were women samurai? They most certainly were. So they had, um, they were called, uh, let me see if I can get this right, onibogeishas. Onibogeishas. So these are women who were usually part of a court of a, of a noble a lord, and they demonstrate physical ability. And they're trained on a naganata. And they are trained by like a, 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 a a man at arms kind of equivalent or another samurai would come in and, and train them on this particular weapon on rare occasions some women were allowed to wear a sword a, a katana in their obi um but that was that was very rare most of the time it was, it was naginata these women were very fierce they were very they had every attribute of a male samurai they they they, they went through the court they had the bushido code they went through the physical regimen so these were not women you wanted to take off okay these are these are women who just they look nice in their kimonos and everything like that but you tick them off then off the nagata comes off the wall and you're in trouble because they know how to use it uh there's a great myth uh, or story about how there was one last stand of the onagaisha where there was a hundred of them holding off opposing forces from getting inside the castle walls 100 women against thousands and they held for like i think half a day before they were wiped out but it gives you the idea of Yes, women can be every bit of the samurai as, as men can. All right, so let's talk about the heyday of the samurai. The uh, Warring States period was very good to the samurai, much like the shinobi. Um, they, let me get my notes here. Um, so basically from about 1300s to um, the early 1600s when the uh, Warring States period ended, the samurai had a really good run of it. Uh, they they were they were warriors. They had they had stipends. They had um, authority. They had power. They had political power uh, in Kyoto, and it, it was just a really good time for them. And to be a samurai meant you had employment, uh, you had purpose, and people respected you because you had to go through a lot, and you have to ups up, uh, hold yourself to a certain code of ethics and behavior. So samurai are very well thought of. And so when there's the Warring States period, they, of course, go into battle and they do their thing. Now, the average day of a samurai would be something where you would wake up in the morning. Uh, you would meditate, uh, you know, on, on the day and on yourself and, and what it means to be samurai. You would go through weapons training. You would go through unarmed training, you know, how, how to fight hand to hand. Um, you would have a break. You would engage in some type of activity that is educational, calligraphy, you know, the, the, the whole, you know, flower arrangement, things of that nature. You would probably do some um, strategic, tactical education as well. And every other day, you would actually go out and take care of things. So you would actually be a, be a policeman on the beat if you were a lower-ranking samurai. If you were a higher-ranking samurai, you would actually, you know, basically do reporting to your to your lord or your commander um as you but then there were parts of the day where if you were a samurai who held land 
you can be a farmer. Most samurai did not do that. They became artisans. So it's not unusual to see art and literature and things of that nature made by samurai. Uh, there's, a, there's a great anime, uh, Miss Hokkaido. Um, no, was it? Hakusa. Hokusa. Hokusa. Miss Hokusa, uh, which is the daughter of the artist Hokusa. And then there's a character in that anime where, he, where there's a, an assistant where she talks about he was a samurai, and I don't know why he's here, but he likes to draw and stuff. Well, that's something a samurai would do. He would go to maybe a local artisan and say, hey, can you teach me these things? And that would be part of his education, of his refinement. Um, he would, uh, so he would engage in these activities. And this is during peacetime. So when there was war, obviously they're going out to battle. Now, they were considered officers in an army, but they really didn't act like officers. Really what they did was they brought in Erika Ritsu. Oh, is that? Here we go. Yeah. Miss Hokusa. Very good anime. Give it a watch sometime. It's really good stuff. I think you can find it on Netflix. Um, so when they went into battle, so went into battle, battle is how the samurai would actually achieve advancement. This is how they got forward. This is how they got, no pun intended, ahead. Okay. <laughs> I know. Yeah, right? Uh, so basically what they would do is they would go into a battle. They would lead a unit of Agaretsu, which are poorly trained soldiers. They would direct them into battle with another group of them. And then once they started being stabby with each other, then they, the samurai, would look for another samurai on the opposite side to do battle with. Because you don't get honor. You don't get benefits for killing a simple soldier. You have to go after other samurai. And if you had a, if you knew a samurai that on the opposite side of renown, uh, someone who was very well known, you were looking for him on the battlefield. So maybe you would be able to identify him by his armor. Armor, Japanese armor was very individual and it's very ornate. So sometimes they could go on the description of that. But this is where, in anime, you, you get that kind of weird moment where everyone announces who they are to each other. You know, they say, I'm Steve Gerhardt. And Brent would go, I'm Brent P. Newhall. Let us fight to the death and for honor and glory. So you would have that weird conversation. And that, those things actually did happen because they're trying to identify each other. I'm so-and-so. Who are you? I'm so-and-so. Okay, you mean nothing. I'm going on to the next guy. You know, so that's literally how it worked. Unless he attacked you anyway and you had to kill him. Now, if you're a higher-ranking samurai and or you had an assistant, that, that squire, someone who's learning to be a samurai, that person would carry a bag with them. And as you started going after other samurai, if you were good at what you were doing, you were able to kill that samurai. You took that guy's head. And while you're taking that guy's head off, your assistant is looking around to make sure no way stabs you in the back, spears you, or you get hit in the forehead with, a, with an arrow. So you take the head as a samurai, and you turn to your assistant and go, put it in the sack system puts it in the sack and off you go to the next victim this is how the samurai worked at the end of the battle if you're side one or you know if, if you had a really particularly good opponent you would go up to your general and your lord and you say i'm going to present you the heads of these samurai before those heads are presented they are actually groomed the heads are groomed so a woman will come in take the head put you know make sure that if the hair's messed up that she would groom it and put it back into a top knot. Um, you know, make you know, like a mortician, make the the face as life like as possible. Put black in the teeth because that's that's a show of of you know vitality. And then take the head, come up to a board <laughs> that has a spike in it. Chunk. You put the head on the board, and you can probably fit like three heads to a board. That's how they made them. And you present them this, this these boards with the heads on it to your lord, to your general, to your commanding officer, and they would look at it and go, oh, that's so-and-so? Wow, okay, thank, thank goodness you're on our side. Thank you, we want to keep you on your side. Here's a stipend, here's a pension. Uh, maybe if, if you were given land, that was outstanding because that meant you could increase your own personal fortune. Um, maybe you get a rise in rank. Maybe you, you go, okay, from now on, you're, you can name your, your heirs as samurai if you want to. These are all very important things. And these are things that the samurai wanted to achieve for themselves and for their family. So that is how they pretty much lived during the, during the Warring States periods. They just, you know, just hacked and slashed their way through it practically. Um, so 
how did it all end? How how did how did the samurai suddenly become, well, persona non grata? Well, it it, it took a little bit of time, but it, it started with on the eve of the unification of Japan by Oda Nobunaga. Excuse me. So, Oda Nobunaga used a piece of technology that advanced Japan greatly. It's the Tanegashima matchlock. But it wasn't just that he used it. It says that he found the proper way to use it. Beforehand, it was considered a defensive weapon, a good defensive weapon, but just a defensive weapon. They didn't really understand how to use it effectively in an offensive manner. For the samurai, they didn't look down on it. They, again, they thought it was as a personal weapon. It was a good thing to have. But for them to be able to advance, they had to do the one-on-one -on -one combat, and that just didn't do it. So what would happen, so what, what happened is Oda Nobunaga put together entire units of Egereshu trained on these, on these matchlocks. And in doing so, he recreated and modernized the Japanese army. So it became less important for the samurai to go out there and kill another samurai. What became more important is that the samurai had to be able to lead these units into battle successfully and kill the other units and use those units to push the enemy back. So it was no longer about personal glory, which meant that the samurai had to stop being warriors and become soldiers. They had to learn, learn a whole new system of tactics, of strategy, of using firearms. And this went completely uh, opposite of, the, of what they had been doing for like close to 300 years, which is we're going to use all these sorts of manner, bladed weapons, bows and arrows, hands and fists, whatever, to achieve our personal gratification. Now it's no longer the case, and now you have to be a soldier. And being a soldier means that you put aside your needs and wants for the needs and wants of, of, of the unit. So that was the first downfall when when samurai started learning oh it's not enough for me to cut somebody's head off i actually have to lead men in battle stay with them and be successful in my mission that's the only way i'm going to advance now so the cutting off of heads and putting on spikes and presenting them not so much a thing anymore so then once the technology started being a factor you had the, unific the actual unification of Japan and the end of the Sengoku period. Once the country was unified under one rule, suddenly there was no more wars. There was no more battles. There were no more rebellions of significant note. There, there was nothing for them to do. They, they, they didn't... Um, they just... They, they had nothing to do. They were bored. So if you have nothing to do and you can't fight anymore, then what's the point of being a samurai? And then it gets worse. In 1635, there is the closed country edict of 1635. What that meant was that nobody could leave Japan without permission. And if you did, if you came back, you will be executed. If you're abroad and you come back, you're executed. If you harbor anyone from outside of Japan without permission, you're executed and a guy who might wash up on your shores. He's executed too. So suddenly, there are no more external enemies. So there's not even, you know, unless somebody's invading Japan, there's no one to fight. There's nobody left to fight. And the whole point of being a samurai is to fight to cause death. That's, that's their job. So then, this is where they start turning into bureaucrats. So what else are they going to do? Well, the lords are going to be a, be scared of the of the samurai because they are still a powerful force. So they want to keep them happy. So how do you keep a board man happy? Well, you give them a job in the bureaucracy. To give you an idea of the bureaucracy. Let's see here. Look out my notes here. I get to look like I actually know what I'm talking about. Put on the glasses here. All right, here we go. 
The most authoritative decree issued by the Bakufu, which is a tent government, to control the peasantry was the Kayan Proclamation of 32 Articles promulgated in 1649. Enjoined peasants to obey Bakufu decrees, considered the, pax, the payment of land tax as their primary responsibility, work diligently at their farming, rise early in the morning to cut grass, cultivate the fields during the day, and make straw ropes and sacks at night. That was law. That's what you had to do. Except when sleeping, they were to devote all their time to farm work, and neither they nor their wives and children were to drink sake or tea. They were to plant bamboo and trees around their houses for use as firewood, and from the first of the year, they were to repair farm equipment to have them ready for the use in spring. Toilets had to be built near the houses, and ample provisions made to store human waste, which was to be turned into fertilizer by mixing with grass and water. They were to apply such fertilization as possible to paddy and upland fields. Regarding their diets, peasants were instructed not to consume all the rice and other cereals after the fall harvest. Instead, as their normal stable, they were to eat barley, millet, and cabbage. And daikon if they could grow it. Point being that the Tokugawa government had complete and other control over everything. And to enforce that control, they wanted to use the samurai to do that. Only they didn't need to use force. They just needed to show up and say, are you making your straw hats today? Good, great. Um, is your is your crapper working? Good, great. Just don't forget to use your own waste to plant the, you know, make the rice grow. Because rice is the currency of the economy. And that's and that's why they have the, the, the uh, shogunate wants the peasants to be solely focused on this. And they want the samurai to solely focus on to make sure that the farmers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, as they control, start controlling the economics of it, and when it's, now that they have no external trade and they have no wars, there's no, no treasure to pillage or anything like that, the economy starts to go down. So the samurai, who can't fight anymore, they kind of earn a stipend. They are paid to be basically unemployed, which means that twice a year they get, they get one half of their stipend, one in, in the, one in the winter and one in the spring. And basically, the, the lords will say, we're going to pay you this stipend, and we're going to pay you just to sit around and be here and not work for anybody else or anything so that you don't get up to mischief and try to rebel against us. So here's some money. We're bribing you. So what do they do with that money? How, how, what, you know, what? Oh, yes. As is John over here goes, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that was part of it. Another part of it was um, drinking and gambling, or you know, drinking, the gambling, um, and anything that was allowed to the samurai to do, which was not much. The Tokugawa shogunate forbade them to do things. Like, at one point, they weren't even allowed to go to, to see a kabuki show. They weren't even allowed to do that at one point. Um, so it was, it was a very tough time for the samurai. So what does the samurai do when they're bored? Well, we have an account, first-hand account, Musui's story, which is a Edo-era uh, samurai, whose real name is Katsu Koichi. Kokichi, sorry. And one of the things he talks about in here is that he, he you know, they, they gamble. And they gamble and they spend money because there's nothing else to do. They spend money on fine swords and, and, uh, and clothes and things like that. So, like, one point he says, challenging students from rival schools was getting to be a regular occupation. That meant that he was just, like, literally picking a fight. Night, night after night, I roamed the streets with my followers in tow every so often just to keep them in their place. I took them to the home of Master Hirayama Shiru to hear them tell stories of Japan and China. My foolishness was dragging me deeper into debt. I wouldn't stop. What he basically was saying there is that he's paying for these meals for not only for his the people who are following him that are supposed to be his students. He's not teaching them anything. And he's taking them to his a, a guy who's respected but an older guy, so he has to pay for that guy's meal. So he's paying a lot of money that he doesn't have. And he goes, I wouldn't stop, even then, and borrowed money with no prospect of being able to repay. I was 21 and penniless. I had no choice but to sell my everyday sword, the Morimitsu I'd bought for 41 Ryo from the dealer Oriakunoma. Sorry for the uh, this slaughter of the Japanese language. At the last moment, I couldn't bear to part with it, even to make an appearance at the commissioner's house. I had only the clothes on my back. To take my mind off my woes, I went to Yoshiwara, which is a gambling district. Because, you know, when you're deep in debt, that's what you do. You gamble more. But you could win big, yes. Or you could do what happened to the rest of the samurai and sell all your possessions. So what would happen, what Masui did, was that to make, <clears throat> to make money, he profited off the misfortune of other samurai. 
Many of the friends I'd helped in times of trouble came to me when they had swords to sell. But since they were not knowledgeable about swords, I never had a loss. At the market, I made a practice of spending half of the profits to treat my fellow dealers to buckwheat noodles or occasional sake. They addressed me as Lord and Master and secretly alerted me beforehand if they heard of a customer coming with a piece of goods. That's how he made his money. He went to his samurai friends who were poor and destitute and said, Hey, I'll get you some money, but I'm gonna, I'll sell you your sword. I'll become a sword, um, you know, market your sword out there. I'll get, get money. Here's your half of it. I'm taking the other half, and I'm spending it lavishly because that's, you know, what he did. That's what they did. That's what low-ranking samurai did because they had nothing else to do. So that's what it looked like to be a samurai in Edo, Japan. Uh, this was probably around uh, 1820s. So what really sealed the deal for the, for the samurai was the opening of Japan by, by the United States. <clears throat> so in, 18, in 1853, again, Perry shows up, and he, has a, and he comes up with a small squadron of uh, the black boats, you know, with, with cannon, uh, 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 you know, up-to-date technology, a show of force, and he, and he, steams, into, <clears throat> he steams into the harbor, and he goes to the emperor, not realizing that it's still the shogun who's in control. But he goes to the emperor and he says, look at my telescope. Look at the telegraph. See how this works? And here's a steam locomotive model engine. Isn't this cool? Here you go. By the way, we're going to need you to make sure that you open two ports in your nation in case we have shipwrecked soldiers or uh, sailors that come in uh, that might happen by. And we're going to need you need to be able to trade with you. We're going we're to need to be able to make provisions with you. So... Uh, we're going to be gone for the next six months, and we're going to come back, and you should have an answer for us. <laughs> so basically threaten the Japanese government. The imperial court passes on the note to the Tokugawa shogunate, who goes, uh, don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> what do I do here? So then this samurai lord, Lord Itokara Katsuakira, from the Anaka domain, does the samurai marathon. He gathers a whole bunch of samurai together and says, we're going to show the fitness of the samurai. We're going to see how well they're doing, and we're going to have them do a race. And during this race, there's no holds barred. You know, you run. If you want to push someone off the trail, you can. If you want to slug someone, knock them out, whatever. You know, we want to show our physical prowess and that, that when the invaders come back, the samurai will be there and we'll drive them from the shores. Not a one makes it. Not a one. They, they, they're out of shape. They can't make it. The ones that are vicious and able to push people off the trail or whatnot will probably stumble over a rock and just go to sleep because they, they, just, they just can't do it. At this point with this display, and this isn't the only samurai marathon that happened, but this was the most famous one, um, the Tokugawa shogunate said, we, we acquiesce. So the United States comes back. Perry comes back, 1854. And they they signed the uh, the treaty, and, tr and not only does the United States get what they asked for, but they are also given most favored nation status, which means that any agreement they make with any nation from here on also has to apply to the United States. So anything that benefits another country also benefits the United States. This is what they do. At this point, the samurai are incensed. They're just like, how could you do that? How could how could this happen? In sense, yeah. <laughs> they, they, how could you do that? We are Japan. We don't bow to anybody. Why is this happening? You know what? And they looked at the Togogawa shogunate and said, "It's your fault. This is your fault." So the emperor at the time, the emperor at the time had two major clans that supported him: the Chosun and the Sats uh, the um, Satsuma. Uh, was it Satsuma? Yeah, Satsuma, um, samurai. So these two clans fully supported the emperor. In 1876, they bring the emperor in, and they declare him the actual authoritative ruler of Japan. They dissolve the Tokugawa shogunate, and the Tokugawa shogunate goes, hold on, hold on, just wait a second. We got samurai too. And they attack the, the Satsuma uh, forces, which are led by Saigo Takamori. We're going to talk about him in a moment. I'm running a little over time. Um, so this causes the Boshin War. And the Boshin War is basically how the Meiji Restoration starts. And the emperor 
his forces win over the Tokugawa shogunate. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of forces up in Hokkaido that make the Izo Republic. Saigo Takamori, under the service of the emperor, goes back up there, kicks their butt, and the Meiji Restoration takes into effect. The Meiji Restoration, of course, is what modernizes Japan, and this is what we're talking at the beginning of it. And they put in, they start putting in new uh, institutions, new technology, new ways of doing things. And one of the things that they did was um, do away with the feudal system, the vassal system, which meant that the samurai were no more. That's it. They were done. The samurai were banned. Now, this doesn't mean that they were jailed or anything like that. As, as a matter of fact, if you were a high-ranking samurai, you could probably find a post in the government. If you're a lower-ranking samurai, you could probably find a post in the local government. So it wasn't like you were kicked to the curb and out on the street, but what it meant to be a samurai, the whole point of being a samurai, the honor, the loyalty, the fealty, all that, gone. A lot of samurai were upset about this. One of them was Saigo Takamori, who devoted himself to the emperor. He didn't like modernization that much unless it was affecting the military, which in case he was a fan of it. But if you were talking about trains, for some reason he really hated trains, don't know why, but he had a problem with them. So he did not like the modernization to begin with, but because he was a great samurai, he was considered one of the greatest of his time, he followed the emperor. Okay, the emperor said this, I am going to retire gracefully. I'm going to set up schools across Japan for samurai to go to to learn new trades, new things. And so while they're learning new stuff, they're still doing their combat exercises. Now keep in mind that the Tanakashima matchlock is now part of that. So that technology of firearms is part of their training, including artillery. Takamori really liked artillery. He liked things that went boom and were very loud. So these schools, about 137 of them, cropped up all over Japan. Takamori is a popular guy. The, the people like him because he's one of the three great nobles that supported the Meiji Restoration. He, he fought in the Boshin War, basically won the Boshin War on his own. And so he was very well thought of. And he went into retirement. And everyone thought it was nice and happy. And then the samurai were banned. And Takemura said, okay, I'm going to retirement. Don't like it, but here I am. Now, how many of you have seen Gundam Origins? And the scene where um, Char Ensemble at the academy with Garma institutes a rebellion. Uh -huh. Okay. And that leads up to the, to the, to the, uh, the one-year war, right? That is what, actually, it's a, that's a nod to what had happened for the Satsuma Rebellion. What happened was that Takamori was content in being, in being uh, retired, but his students were mad. They hated it. And then the government did something stupid and sent in police officers to, in, uh, to investigate the students, and they thought it was a way to assassinate Takamori. So they got mad, hit the naval shipyards at Nagasaki and Kyoto, took the provisions, declared victory, sent a letter to Takamori, said, we are in rebellion, lead us. Takamori reluctantly agreed. And he went into the Satsuma, uh, Satsuma Rebellion, whereupon he died. I mean, he, he, he obviously he lost the war. But here's the thing. He is considered the last samurai. Right. The book says... The real life story that inspired the movie, last time I read Tom Cruise, don't watch the movie, it's historically inaccurate. But he is considered to be the last great samurai. So in his rebellion, he did very well. Until, the, of course, the end when he you know, had um, um, not as much supplies, he's being driven to the hinterlands, he's finally encircled, he uh, gets a wound in his thigh, and he dies on the battlefield. And it is... As we talk about getting the heads and putting them on a pike into being and having them delivered, it is a sign of way of showing the people it's over. We have his head. It's done. It's over. After well, he died on the battlefield, a couple other samurai cut off his head, hid the head, in an effort to prevent the imperial forces from finding it and declaring total victory. They can claim victory because they win the battle, but they're not able to convince the populace that the man is dead unless they have his head. That's kind of why they also, back in medieval Europe, they put heads on pikes to prove, yes, the dude is dead, so your rebellion's over. 
At first, they couldn't find the head. And so the rebellion was kind of still on, even though they did a last charge of 300 samurai and got totally wiped out. They finally found the head. Now, this is where it kind of gets into myth. Um, they say that the head was treated well and it was washed in a stream and the emperor cried over him and all this wonderful stuff. And here is a, such a man, such a man. Did not happen. Did not happen. Here's how the samurai ended with the last samurai. This is an account from Captain Hubbard, a uh, captain of a vessel from Boston. He was there when the bodies of the samurai leaders were presented. This is what he had to say about Saigo Takamori. He was a large, powerful looking man, his skin almost white. His clothing had been taken off and he lay there naked. It was a few seconds before he realized that his head was cut off. Next to Saigo lay Kirino the Mutsura. Saigo's was the only headless body but the others were a fearful sight to look at. Their heads were dreadfully cut up, and it was quite evidence that, that, that they killed each other. No doubt their heads would all have been cut off by their own people had time permitted. While we were looking at the bodies, Saigo's head was brought in and placed by his body. It was a remarkable looking head, and anyone would have said at once that he must have been the leader. And that is the end of the samurai. Thank you for having me at this panel. Do you have questions? That is really cool. Uh, thank you, Steve. So um, I have a question. What's your question? Um, what are some of your favorite samurai anime? Ooh, um, definitely uh, Samurai Champloo. I've, I've always enjoyed that one. Um, it, it Actually, we were talking about it earlier. It, it has a great... Um, um, but it talks about uh, towards the end, it's, it's placed at the end of the samurai era mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just in different modes of, of thought of the samurai and also of Christianity. So mm -hmm. it's really pretty good. Uh, you know, of course, there's always, you know, what can I say about Rurouni Kenshin? I mean, it's just, you know, what, what can you say? It's, it's, it's that, right, it's right there. <laughs> what, what more can one yeah. say? Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, uh, the, you know, anything, any, oh, uh, Samurai 7, I actually really do like Samurai 7, mm -hmm. which is uh, definitely a, a uh, retelling of <laughs> Akira Kurosawa's. Yeah. Uh, when the and, mecha show up. Yeah, when the, the mecha end. show up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, those, uh, those are some, uh, some fun, mm -hmm. some fun of the, some fun anime is mm -hmm. like Kintana and, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about uh, live action? Live action, uh, pretty much any of the Akira Kurosawa movies. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, of you course say trilogy. There's, yeah, oh yeah, the so Rashomon, so, Rashomon, um, Rashomon, Seven Samurai, the Samurai trilogy, uh, the Hidden Fortress, Fortress. and um, the Blood Throne, the Bloody Throne, oh, the, blood, yes, the Blood yeah, Throne, yeah, which is actually uh, the the Scottish play or uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth, but yeah. it's told by the by the point of view of the mm -hmm. samurai. Um, those are very very good movies. There's also another movie. Where if you want to watch it and and see how well, because a lot of um, there was a question in chat, are there still samurai today? And the answer is actually kind of yes. Mm. Um, so in terms of skill with the sword, as in actually how you would use it with the katana, mm -hmm. uh, Sword of Doom uh, mm -hmm. is is a good movie, and it shows really great choreographed fight scenes that a lot of instructors say, no, this is how you use it, this is how you wield it. And it's a good movie in general. It just shows about the descent of madness of a samurai, but uh, uh, focusing on one particular sword. Um, yeah. Um, so the question, uh, Captain Laser Eyes, yeah. Um, are there still samurai today? Sort of. Um, what is taught is basically the, co the core concepts of the Bushido Code, and it's adapted to business, mm -hmm. um, to a lot of business, and to... Uh, you know, for people who want to improve their lives, it's a, it's a great way to, um, you know, go, go about your life, frugality, you know, being loyal to your friends and things like that. Um, but there are no actual samurai yeah. today. There are, however, samurai families. I'm going to say, yeah. So, which is a little bit different. So there are people that can, that can uh, trace their lineage back to a samurai family. And some samurai families, I think, still collect a pension. Mm, okay. um, oddly enough, um, it's yeah. it's not much, but you know, yeah. it's a couple cents on the dollar, literally. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 a source of pride. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Akira Kurosawa is from a samurai family. His his father, 
And in World War II, it was not unusual for um, descendants of the samurai, yes, there are descendants, samurai descendants, uh, to in World War II to have been uh, become officers. So that was not uh, that was not unusual to have your pedigree as an officer read. Oh, I served here, here, here. Oh, and he's the son of a of a of a samurai family. Makes sense. Now, do you yeah. have any, any titleage with samurai family left? No. So, like, you know, you have you yeah. know, the maquis of something or other. You have a count. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. not really, because they've they've gone away from the feudal system. Yeah, there's so, no so there's no real, um, and and it was not considered a title of nobility, mm -hmm. even though it's hereditary. So, um, in order to be a samurai, you actually have to be a samurai. Mm -hmm. You can be of a samurai family, but you have to have another samurai to acknowledge you as a samurai. Mm -hmm. So, since there are no more samurai, yeah, and yeah. I guess technically because the the government has literally like changed, like we right. no longer have a feudal samurai system, you know, you still have the title because you you know you were given the title, right? But it doesn't give you any power. And that, yeah, there's power no there's no real shift. benefits. There's yeah. no real power. Yeah. The, it's well, it's I mean, more of a. Once, once you had the revolution in France, you still to mm. this day have a dauphin. Right. You know, you mm. still right. Have right. The yeah. nobility that's there, yeah. but the the old republic. What, is, what you away the, the, uh, yeah. and what you do have is <laughs> great neo samurai. What you do have is um, social status with being mm -hmm. from a samurai family. That gives you a certain level of it opens certain doors for you. Sure. Okay. So yeah. you know if you were so if you're a businessman Rockefeller, like right. Rockefeller, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you're a businessman and you can claim samurai li lineage, that might open a door to an interview for you or mm -hmm. so, or some type of social status. Um, quite often in uh, exa uh, uh, like pre-war Japan, it wasn't uncommon for, again, I, I use Akira Kurosawa's family as, as an example, where one half of the family would be a merchant family and the other half, half would be a samurai family so that you would be wealthy because the samurai could open the doors for the, wealth, mm -hmm. for, for the merchant family. Mm -hmm. So it kind of works out in that way. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Anything else you wanted to bring up? Um... No, actually, I think I think we're all good. Unless anybody else in chat lane has a question. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much. This is the end of OnCon Six. Appreciate having you all here. Um, appreciate uh, having an audience to share all this out with. Um, all these videos will be available on the YouTube channel uh, once they have a chance to process, and we'll chop them out into individual videos uh, and have them available for it as individual panel videos. If you want to come back and uh, revisit this material, they will be there. And uh, yeah, that'll do it for us for uh, Uncon Six. So thank you all so thank much. Thank you. Thank Absolutely you so much. Yes. See you. Uh, See you. Bye all. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye.